<laughs> the joys of live TV. Everyone uh, got anyway. to see the outtakes before yeah. the end. <laughs> We're having a good time today. Uh, so my name is Mike Hess. I am Senior Director of Public Outreach and Education, certainly not Information Technology, uh, with the COPDA Foundation. Uh, I'm also project leader of our Oxygen 360 project, where we're trying to improve access to therapies and certainly improve education and how to use these things. Uh, those of you who have seen our previous Facebook Lives, which also uh, tend to have some tech issues from time to time, uh, may be very familiar with my good friend, John Linnell. John? Hey, everybody. I'm John Linnell. I am a COPD patient and a patient advocate. Uh, I do a lot with the COPD Foundation. I've had uh, COPD for a little over 16 years, and I am uh, one of the patient partners working with Mike on the uh, Oxygen 360 initiative through the foundation. We have a great show, and right now I'm going to uh, let Ryan Deesom, our uh, RT Oxyphile extraordinaire, introduce himself. Hi guys, uh, thanks for having me. I uh, really appreciate the uh, opportunity to be on here, and uh, hopefully we can, uh, you know, answer a lot of questions. And I'm sure we could talk all day. Um, so, you know, maybe in the future we could do another one if uh, if it shows that we don't get through everything that we want to. Which I'm guessing that's going to be the case. But uh, <laughs> I've been uh, working with oxygen equipment for you know probably 16, 17 years now. Respiratory therapist, um, regular contributor to the uh, pulmonary paper. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the background. So I uh, do a lot of testing on portable concentrators, all kinds of oxygen equipment. Uh, so that's kind of where my knowledge lies and, and understanding and uh, understanding how the, the, the devices perform and how that it can impact you. Um, and just, uh, you know, kind of learned all that on my own over the years. And uh, it's been a, a, a good uh, a good experience. And uh, I'm glad I can kind of give back here and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, Hopefully we can get through this uh, without any more problems, and uh, we'll go to Mike, and uh, I guess we'll get this started here. Yes. Well, it's it's always a wild ride, as John describes us. We're the never ready for prime time players. That one may have come through. I might have fixed his audio for that one. Um, but in any event, we've already got uh, Nancy saying thanks for being here. Ryan Mark Mangus says good to see you. Uh, Phyllis says thanks for being here. Love your pieces in the pulmonary paper. We are really excited to for, to have Ryan here. Um, and if our conversation goes anything like the the pre show conversation, uh, it's going to be fantastic. Before we jump in. I just want to uh, touch on a couple of things. Again, this is November. This is COPD Awareness Month. I would love to get people uh, to the COPD Foundation's website so that you can help us par or, uh, spread the message about our Lace Up for Lungs campaign. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, getting the message out there a little bit more. We've got some snazzy orange shoelaces uh, that are available for a small donation to help us do some fundraising for research and awareness efforts. But uh, you don't even necessarily need to do that. Uh, all you need to do is get your orange on, get some pictures taken, get some videos taking, taken. Um, you can download our, our little form that says who you want to lace up for and help us spread the word about COPD. While you're there, you can check out a lot of our other educational materials. Uh, you can also sign up for some of our newsletters. And you can check out the first couple episodes of our brand new podcast that we've been doing in collaboration with Health Unmuted uh, that has some fantastic interviews, uh, including with, uh, with John here about living with COPD, living well with COPD, and a lot of the therapy options that are available. So with that, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. John, lead us off a little bit by kind of explaining to us, uh, sharing with us your journey um, into the use of portable oxygen. Well, with my COPD, I had been using my stationary concentrator just to sleep with oxygen. That's the only time I needed it was, was at night. But uh, uh, probably eight years ago or so, I, I needed oxygen under exertion just to, to get around i was uh uh becoming desaturated far too quickly w without it and of course i use the uh always have a, a oximeter with you 
And at Mayo Clinic, my, my pulmonologist, Dr. Benzo, prescribed a, an oxygen concentrator for me and sent me off to the uh, pulmonary rehab uh, lab that they have there because he wanted me to talk to their uh, RT that ran that program just to make sure that I uh, understood what else I could do for myself at home. And, uh, you know, he gave me some stretchy bands and exercise program, but then he looked at my prescription for the portable oxygen concentrator and said, wait a minute, if you have a few minutes, let me go find the doctor. I want to have him rewrite this. I said, well, what's wrong with the prescription? Well, he's asking for a unit and the prescription for you should really say, because you're on Medicare now and you need something that's going to oxygenate you, the prescriptions for a device, and it needs to be written a little differently. So if you outgrow the device or the device isn't working for you, it will be changed to something that will work for you. And you know, I'm hoping Ryan can get more into that because that's, the technical stuff that I, I really don't grasp, but I was thankful that I had a good RT that caught that. So then when I went to my 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 provider, my supplier, my DME uh, in, in Rochester, Minnesota at the time, they had some options for me to choose from. And I, I got one and I, I'm really glad it, it didn't, it wasn't, just the right one for me. It didn't work. And, you know, so often, and I, I hope there are a ton of questions because I really want Ryan to take the lead through this because he's the expert. But just to get things started, my question was, well, which one do I use? What, what do I do? And I've learned you've got to try, even though I wasn't buying, the, the phrase is try before you buy. Don't commit unless you know it will work for you because you're you're stuck with that thing if you bought it or you're stuck with it if you have a five-year medicare contract so we really need to be aware of those ins and outs and the other thing i needed to do is i had to learn to change the way i breathed i, I kept breathing I, I didn't stop breathing but Oxygen concentrators, as I hope Ryan explains what a bolus is, it only produces oxygen when you inhale. Well, it, it takes time to generate the next burst or bolus that you can inhale. So I thought, just calm down, John. It'll be okay because you're going to get a really, really good breath here in a few seconds. And so I... For me, I'm not telling anyone what to do. I slowed my rate of breathing down a little bit. And I found that it oxygenated me better because I was getting more oxygen. So anyway, but that's that's kind of my story, how I became to have one and, and to use one. So you take care of them and they, they work well for you. Ryan, your, your, your thoughts on my yeah, experience? So I'll start off, yeah, I'll start off saying, you know, your experience, I think, is, is probably more unique than most uh, in that you had an RT that kind of understood the, the limitations of, of the system, uh, as it were, and, you know, at least was able to get you, uh, you know, a, a prescription that said, all right, you know, we can't tie it to a specific device. You know, we need to make sure it oxygenates you. So, you know, did you go through a six minute walk test to have that prescription made? Was that kind of your baseline uh, information that they they made the prescription on? They, they did, but not, not using the portable concentrator. But right. I, as right. part of my, because I was, I was new at Mayo, so I had, I, they wanted a benchmark for everything. So we did the six minute walk. We did the, the step, the stair step walk. We did uh, uh, a heart echo. I mean, they got, that's Mayo Clinic. They, yeah. the, the, we, we did it. We did, we did everything except the bronchoscopy. Sure. Sure. So, you know, you're kind of in a situation where, you know, the, the people are knowledgeable. There are, there are a lot of pulmonologists, doctors, clinicians, 
caregivers that don't really understand uh, how a lot of these oxygen products work. Um, so they understand, you know, the, the very basics, but if they see a two on a dial on a, on a portable concentrator, you know, the inclination, you know, just with their basic, you know, basic knowledge is that that's two liters a minute. Whereas I think most of us know at this point that, you know, a two on a pulse device is, is not really two liters a minute. Um, you know, and, you know, if there's one thing to take away from this, this entire presentation is, is do not rely on the number on a, on a pulse uh, device. You know, it doesn't necessarily even have to be a portable concentrator. If you have a pulsing regulator, um, you know, some, on some of those, the, 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 the dose can vary and it's not really equivalent to uh, two liters a minute of continuous flow. There, there's very different dynamics that are occurring when somebody is breathing on a continuous flow machine versus a, a pulse machine. Continuous, you know you're getting two liters a minute. You know, and on an oxygen concentrator, you're getting roughly 90 to 95%, you know, pure oxygen. So that's, that's close enough to 100% that, you know, the chances of that really being a, an, an issue are limited. But you have that constant oxygen flowing there um, so even during exhalation, there's still oxygen being delivered there. So you get some aura around here that increases the, the uh, inspired oxygen here. Um, you know that you are getting that oxygen because it's continuously running. Once you get to a pulse device, as you kind of mentioned, you had to teach yourself to breathe because you wanted to be like, I want to make sure I'm getting my pulse uh, in and, you know, as, as large a pulse as I can. So, um, the thing with the portable concentrators and especially the pulse ones to know is that as your respiratory rate increases, which typically comes with activity or stress or anything like that, as your respiratory rate increases, those devices lower the, the volume that you get per breath. So when you were breathing faster on it compared to when you were breathing slower, over time, you weren't getting much different volume total, but the volume we were getting at the time increased as you kind of calm down and your breath rate slowed. Um, so that does impact FiO2. And then the dynamics of, of your breathing. So if you are actively breathing and going, you know, you're the, the, the pressure that your negative pressure that you're creating in your nose is what causes the device to trigger. So when you're breathing fast, that device should be able to trigger right away but as you slow down and as your breathing gets shallower and especially you know if you're kind of laying on a couch or whatever and you might be falling asleep when you're when your breathing gets shallow it takes a little bit longer for your that negative pressure in your nose to get to that threshold where the device triggers so that pulse volume is coming in later in your breathing cycle um, and in some cases if you're breathing shallow enough it might not pick it up at all so in that case, you know, you might hear people say they sleep on their portable concentrators and that's, you know, that's okay if it works for them, but you know, that's not a given. The, if you're sleeping, the cannula could come out. Anything that impacts the interface with your nose could impact how much oxygen you're getting and your breathing pattern will do that too. So, you know, somebody asked me, can I sleep on my portable concentrator? And I have to say, I can't recommend you do that. I can't stop you from doing that, but I can't recommend that you do that just because there are too many variables, at least with a, a continuous flow device on, again, that stuff is running. So even if you do move and your cannula kind of becomes dislodged, there's at least some aura of oxygen going there. That's not going to happen on your on your portable concentrator. Right, right. And um, the thing too, the, the first portable I had, had a sleep mode on it. But you know, to, yeah. to, quote, to, to quote Colonel Potter, horse bucky. Right. And so, so what does that tell you? It says sleep mode. All right. You know, unless you're like kind of perusing the, the manual and like looking real closely, that's not going to really give you any indication of what that actually does. Yeah. On one portable concentrator, that might mean that it's an increased sensitivity. So they, they lower that threshold so it, it can trigger a little bit quicker. On another portable concentrator, that might mean that they change how the dose is delivered in that pulse. So you need to like look at that information. Just seeing a sleep mode on, on the concentrator isn't really going to tell you anything. Right. You know, and you would, anything, you would it, mention it kind of promotes the idea that, yes, you can sleep on this where, you know, again, I, I would say, no, you should not be sleeping on a portable concentrator. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you agreed and mentioned that, that, that those numbers, the one through 
three, four, five, six, depending on which uh, unit you have, really are, are meaningless. I wish I could give credit because I can't remember who said it yesterday in a conversation, but they said, why can't they make them letters? A, B, C, D, E, because that would be standard and everyone it, it just and, and I, I thought, you know, that really makes a lot of sense because it's just so misleading because so many people think, oh, it goes up to six. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's the number six. I can draw you a number six and I won't charge you twenty five hundred dollars. Right. So I, I think some of that goes back to just kind of how oxygen devices were approved over the years. So in, in many ways, that's kind of a, a systematic issue, how we got to this point where that really isn't regulated. Um, I will say one of the nice things that has happened in the past few years is that manufacturers have been told um, and they are mandated to actually put pulse volumes in their manuals for portable concentrators. So if you have a portable concentrator that is a pulse device, you know, it does tell you at a certain breath rate, you know, what, what pulse volume you're getting. Uh, but again, that's not going to be equivalent to a, a continuous flow. And unless you know, like the mathematics that are involved in continuous flow, there really isn't a way for you to compare that to. You just know that that's what that device is giving at a given setting at a given rate. And those are, you know, those are three different variables. So uh, how do you, you know, but how do you explain how do you explain to the lay patient, to the new patient, what a bolus is? And if if the bolus is forty five milliliters, what what the what the bleep does that mean? Well, exactly. What what does that mean? It means that's what that device does at, at that setting. And to, to answer the question about the bolus, since this uh, you know you mentioned this earlier, a bolus is basically the the pulse volume that you get from the 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 concentrator or or pulse regulator um, so, so it's, would that burst? Short, it's that short quick burst of oxygen burst. typically you know those can be anywhere from five to 15 liters a minute over a very short period you know tenths of a second or so um so when you're with somebody or you know when you're on your oxygen machine and you hear the psh, 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 when you're breathing that's your bolus you know, that's your bolus volume of oxygen going in. Um, and as we've kind of discussed, you know, every portable concentrator is going to be a little different with that uh, volume. So even if even if you have two devices that say, all right, that's setting four at 20 breaths a minute, I'm delivering 45 milliliters of oxygen. One of those devices may be delivering it at 10 liters a minute for a, a really short period. The other one might be at five liters a minute for twice as long, and that's going to impact your FiO2 too. Because if that if that longer one uh, is delivering towards the end of your inspiration, that might just stay in your upper airways. It might not get in deeper into your lungs. So that's the one thing that we don't really know unless you test it, which is very difficult to do. You know, certainly lay people cannot you know test a portable concentrator on their own, um, but if you test that, I kind of lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Bol bolus. You know, have, Bol yeah, bolus is a burst. At, at a short period, 45 mils over a bit longer, you know, the, the manufacturers don't tell you what those shapes look like. So you can't really, you can't really tell. It might tell you the same volume, but the shape of that bolus might actually impact how much oxygen you're getting as well. So, and that can be individualized to each person. Your breathing pattern isn't the same as mine, isn't the same as Mike's, isn't the same as anybody else that is watching this right now. So, you know, you can try all the math and, you know, try all the, the, the trends or whatever, but ultimately it comes down to, you know, this really is an individual uh, situation that needs to be uh, addressed that way and not as kind of a, all right, we have, you know, you can have guidelines or whatever, but you have to be willing to kind of, you know, think outside the box and be like, all right, I need to make sure that I'm getting uh, what I need to do my activities uh, daily. And for some people that, you know, may have the same conditions and, and whatever, those two things might be very different. So. Um, okay, Ryan, then well, how, I, I, how I, do you, how do you, how do you tell a person that goes to you and says, I need to get a portable oxygen concentrator. How do I go about deciding which one 
will work for me. So Ryan, but you before you jump into that, I, I don't want to do. Ahead. I don't want to put you too far off your train of thought before you leave the station too much. Um, just want to jump in real quick. We are getting a boatload of great questions coming in through the comments. Um, I don't know that we're going to be able to get all, to all of them today, but I do want to throw out there that Ryan has very graciously agreed to come back next Wednesday for our monthly OxyTalk virtual oxygen coffee hour. So if we don't get to your question today, um, you can come, uh, you can, we'll drop a link in the comments and we'll get more information out to you. You can come join us on Zoom next week. It'll be four o'clock Eastern time, just like this one was. And we'll uh, get through a lot more of those questions in that time. A couple other things that popped through that are quite relevant. We did actually have somebody who asked what a bolus was, so hopefully we got that answered for you. Uh, we also had somebody asking about, um, is there a, a, uh, a diagram or a list or a chart or something of equipment that has the FiO2 and has the pulses, the, the boluses on there and everything. Um, Ryan, you may have some better information about this. I will throw it out to the American Association for Respiratory Care that has a guide to portable oxygen concentrators that has some of that information listed in there. I'll, I'll caution that it may not make a whole lot of sense uh, without uh, some of this additional background, um, but I did want to throw that out there because it was pretty relevant to where we were um, right now. So, and like I said, we've got a whole bunch of other questions in there that hopefully we're going to be able to get to. Um, but I do want to get back to John's question about, uh, uh, I want to get back to John's question. So how does someone, because I'm sure a lot of people that are listening that are asking the questions and then let's go to their questions, not me. How, how does someone decide on a concentrator? So, yeah, I mean, that that probably is the, the most frequent question that I get. What what concentrator is right for me? And, you know, my typical answer is the one that can oxygenate you at all of the activities that you intend to be doing with it. And that's a very kind of abstract answer, but, um, you know, kind of supporting the, the individualized nature of how we should be approaching this. Uh, is, all right, I need to know some information from you about what your needs are. Um, you know, all right, so your prescription might say, you know, I need two liters at rest and four liters when I'm at active, you know, and that's a, a fairly common kind of base prescription. Um, and if somebody said, you know, if somebody said to me, I need four liters or more at activity, you know, my first kind of approach would be all right then some of these smaller portable concentrators as appealing as they might be for you might not be able to meet your needs so to your point that you don't want to buy a bookend or something that's not going to you know be able to to satisfy your oxygen needs and just end up sitting on a shelf that's kind of the approach that i'm taking is and hopefully others are as well is that all right we need to know what your oxygen needs are and we need to be aware of what these devices are capable of doing. And I can say from my years of research, you know, and it's not like a hundred percent, you know, a blanket statement, but chances are, if you need four liters or more at any point for whatever it is you're doing, um, the portable concentrators are going to be very limited and not, you know, some of them may not, you know, even, even be a, a viable option for you. That doesn't stop some people from buying it. You know, some people approach it as, well, I'd rather have something than nothing, you know, and kind of work within those limitations. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, from a therapist perspective, you, you're like, you know, I don't want you to be doing that. But we also have to recognize we are really, you know, handcuffing uh, people uh, with kind of the, the, the Medicare reimbursement that's out there. The, the, the amount of support that we can give people like John when they're asking this question, um, you know, is, is very limited. So um, we need to be aware, you know, we as clinicians and people that are, are giving this of what these devices are. And unfortunately, there aren't a lot of people out there that really understand the, the broader scope of that. So somebody asked that question to somebody that's not really as knowledgeable, you know, they're probably not going to get a solid answer. So this is where I say, and this is very important, is that you absolutely need to be an advocate for yourself. You need to have a support system around. 
anybody that is watching this right now, uh, you know, in search of information, you are being an advocate for yourself. So that is very important. Trying to trying to to learn and get a better understanding of your condition, uh, what you know, what options are out there for me, uh, and that's where it falls on folks like me to be like, all right, you know, now I understand where you're coming from. I need to be able to appropriately give you advice. And I think you know we fail. You know, we the royal we kind of fail a lot uh, in in healthcare when it comes to providing appropriate equipment. So. Um, you know, I get that question a lot and I, I do my best to, to kind of guide, guide folks. Some people are a little more stubborn than others and, you know, still want, still want the smallest, lightest device. And maybe that works for them in some situations, but, um, you know, ideally I'm approaching it as what products, you know, product or products can I recommend to you that is going to give you the longest, uh, or the best opportunity to be oxygenated every day and for the longest amount of time. Um, you know, understanding that people's conditions are gonna change, uh, you know, all, all that type of thing. So, and, and some of those, you know, conditions can change overnight. So somebody that is used to, to certain products or devices, you know, one week, they might have an exacerbation or something and that changes and, uh, you know, they might need more and all of a sudden they find themselves uh, limited by the, the, the options that are now available to them. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a further discussion of, how, you know, how, how, how can we best handle that? Um, and that's not an easy discussion. So kind of on the long, along the lines of being a good self-advocate and also uh, helping to communicate and determine what an individual's needs are. One of the earliest questions we got was you had talked about the oxygen titration, the walking around, and uh, you mentioned six minutes. And this person asks, what if your clinician doesn't walk you for six minutes? Now, in my experience uh, working in uh, the outpatient setting, if you have somebody whose oxygen drops in less than six minutes, that's fine. I mean, you know that they need oxygen, obviously. But I've also seen it where somebody can walk for a given period of time uh, in the clinic and not really desaturate much. They don't lose their oxygen levels. But then when they get home and they have to climb a flight of stairs or you know, they're carrying groceries up or they're carrying laundry down or they're doing all these things, that's when they really need the oxygen. And we, on the clinical side again, haven't really done a good job of meeting people literally where they live in some cases. So can you speak a little bit more about how people can do, uh, can be a more effective advocate and say, hey, I really do think I need oxygen at home because this setting doesn't represent how and where I live. Yes, exactly. Um, that is, you know, a primary limitation of that six minute walk test, you know, to be used as a titration tool. Yes, it's a tool but it is hardly a uh, all encompassing tool by any means for the, for the exact situations that you described. It, it's not the same as somebody bringing in groceries and bending them over, putting them in the cabinet, you know, doing their dishes, putting those up in the cabinet, you know, walking up the stairs to go make the bed or, you know, go out to the, the garden or walk, you know, all of these different things, you know, a six minute walk test is you're pretty much walking on a flat surface for six minutes and sometimes even less, you know, um, so it is really not a, a good tool to determine, you know, how much oxygen somebody needs. So, you know, if you are in this situation where, all right, I have my prescription, but man, I'm still feeling short of breath. You have your pulse oximeter and you're looking at it and it's, you know, it's showing you kind of low. Um, those are the things, situations that you probably should be documenting that. Uh, you know, that pulse oximeter can be a, a, a great tool to, to kind of show your trends and where your needs really lie, um, you know, and you can bring that information to your doctor or your pulmonologist and say, look, you know, I've been, I've been doing these activities and, you know, at these settings that you prescribe me or the, you know, with these devices or whatever and say, I'm, I'm having trouble with this um, and I'm not getting what I need. Um, so in, in, in the idea of advocating for yourself, you know, you might have to do your own self research, uh, because, you know, there is, there is a significant divide between what happens in the clinic and what happens at home. Um, when, whenever I do these types of presentations, I always talk about the, the difference in the hospital setting 
versus the home setting because those are two very unique uh, 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 settings. And, you know, the hospital, they don't really have to worry about oxygen. They got those big tanks outside. They can turn up the flow meter, turn it down, whatever. Uh, they don't have to worry about tank resupplies. Um, they're not really using concentrators. Their, their products there are very limited and, you know, don't really have to worry about it much. And the people that work in those situations, a lot of times that's their exposure to oxygen. You know, so that's how they think it is. And they don't understand the, the complexities of living at home, needing oxygen. Um, so that's where it, it, it really does kind of fall on you to be like, all right, I need to understand where my needs are, you know, what I'm doing. Am, am I desaturating at night? You know, that might not be easy to tell with a pulse oximeter because you're sleeping, but, um, you know, there are tools to do that, home tools, uh, you know, either a, a you know, a CPAP test or whatever that just gives you a cannula. Um, there are there are ways to have that done. So you could, you know, you could ask your doctor, you know, can I monitor my SATs at night? And then they'd be able to provide a, a, a device for you. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, whatever activities you're doing or wanting to do, uh, you know, if it's going out to the restaurant or whatever, do your best to kind of track track your activity and what your oxygenation is like. You know, and if, if you're sitting there, uh, you know, using a product and you feel like you need to stay at that setting uh, and you have settings that are above that, you know, feel if you need oxygen, feel free to go up, you know, turn that setting up to, to at least get you as much oxygen as you need to get your sats back up into the area that you want it to be. Um, you don't in, in those situations, you don't really have to worry about, um, you know, uh, getting too much oxygen. You, you already need oxygen, so you need more. So if, if you're one of those folks that are walking around, leaving your device set to two and you feel like I need more oxygen, you're looking at your, your uh, pulse ox and it's saying, you know, 87, you know, feel free to turn up your setting to three or four or whatever it is that you need to get your SAS back up. Because once you start kind of down that hill, it's harder to come back up than it is to kind of stay up there and, and keep your SATs up. So. So I want to that, throw a couple of, I, I, I think so, um, okay. throw a couple of things out there and then I want to hand something over to John. So Jimmy, one of our fantastic COPD state advocacy captains, uh, thanks for joining us today, Jimmy, um, agrees wholeheartedly. He says, right when you were starting to go into keeping a log and all that, he was saying, this is where a working daily diary needs to be done. Then your next doctor visit, you can show him or her where you were struggling. And then also uh, we heard a couple of times from Noah who mentioned you can use uh, Bluetooth apps, Bluetooth oximeters, that sort of thing, um, which can also, you know, if, depending on the kind of watch and things like that, you have some of these smart devices that can actually log that overnight um, and have at least some of that to, and then have some evidence to, uh, to drive for a more formal overnight oximetry study. Uh, Nancy, I wanted to throw her question out there too, because um, I think I can I, I can field this one. But correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if oxygen drops in less than six minutes, how can a doctor know how much you need? Like two liters or three three liters or four liters? Well, the idea behind some of these tests is you walk and then you desaturate to prove that you need oxygen, and then you keep walking around while wearing oxygen in the facility, and then when you get to a setting where you're not dropping that's what you need. Now, again, that's got some of those same limitations where it's not going to be the same kind of environment, maybe not the same stairs or hills or all that sort of thing, but that's kind of the rough concept of it. So even if it's less than six minutes, you can get some kind of ballpark and then go into what Ryan was saying uh, about uh, making sure you're using your tools, which I think was another thing, Noah, a phrase Noah threw, threw out there, making sure you're using your tools like your oximeter to make sure that you're in that safe range. But uh, John, we also had uh, Sherma who asked, why does John not need oxygen right now? So would you be uh, able to explain that a little bit? Oh, that's a very, very, very legitimate question. Uh, uh, if I was wearing it now, it would simply be for a prop. And I don't do that. I'm, I'm me. You get the real me. I, uh, I sleep with oxygen at night. I desaturate relatively quickly right now when I'm ambulatory or exerting myself. So I do have a portable oxygen concentrator and I never leave the house without it because I, I need it. And I, I desaturate if, if I don't have it uh, right now, my, well, well, I mean, we could, we could even, we'll do it together. Why not? You know? So uh, 
and this one uh, is connected to Bluetooth and everything. Right now I'm at 94 with a pulse of uh, 88. And my pulse is usually a little lower, but it, it's jacked right now because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on stage. So it gets me kind of, it gets the adrenaline going. But uh, I, I'm thankful that I don't need that. But uh, I, I do need it with any type of movement. And just a real quick, quick comment on what Ryan and Mike were both saying about the settings aren't the same, a hospital versus at home. I've got stairs at home. I hate stairs. I, they're, they're a struggle for me. At, at, in a hospital or clinic setting, there, there aren't stairs. You're in your hospital room or, or, or whatever if you're, uh, if you're admitted. So that, that's a huge point, especially when choosing what type of oxygen system you're going to use it's got to work for you in your setting in your environment some great points uh, so to, oh sorry oh, i just kind of want you know there are a lot of oxygen oxygen users that don't need oxygen when they're sitting and at rest you know your body isn't needing to metabolize as, as much uh, uh oxygen so you know your your sats are fine you're 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 breathing at a shallower or a, a, a slower rate. You're taking bigger breaths. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot of oxygen users don't need oxygen and at rest. And it's okay if, if you have if you have a device and you're on it and you sit down and your sats are 98, you know, feel free to take it off and see if your sats drop. And if you're staying in the 90s like John is at 94, feel free to keep it off. But if you know you're going to need it when you get up to go to the bathroom and, you know, and a couple hours or whatever, maybe turn it back on a couple minutes before you're going to go do that. Uh, just to kind of give your yourself a little bit of an oxygen boost, as it were. And once you get up and walking, you're, you're, you already know that you're getting that supplemental oxygen that you were going to need yep. anyway. So, um, yeah, if you're out and about or at home or whatever, and you, you're spot checking your oximetry and you're looking good, you know, feel free to go down on the setting or, or turn it off altogether if you're, you're able to do that. And to that point, I will say, like, uh, as we kind of mentioned at the beginning, these portable oxygen concentrators at lower rates, they give bigger volumes um, than they do at, at faster rates. So a lot of times that's enough to oxygenate people. And then they get up and start walking around, even if, even if they've turned it up and all of a sudden they're, you know, they're, they're huffing and puffing a little bit and not, and not getting enough. Well, they probably didn't need that much oxygen when they were at rest. And now that they're up and active, they do. And the concentrator isn't meeting that need. So if they're already at a maximum setting, then that, that device is not appropriate for activity. So that actually leads us really into a really good question from Jill. Um, Jill says, do you increase the oxygen when you get short of breath when doing harder tasks? And is it dangerous to get too much oxygen while doing a task? No. Like, as I said, if you if you need oxygen for a given task, if you're checking your oximetry and you're you're in the 80s, you need oxygen, turn it up. If you already know you're going to need that much oxygen, turn it up then. Um, you're not going to over oxygenate yourself. And I, I think there is still kind of the old old train of thought that, yes, you can over oxygenate yourself. And and really, if you're needing uh, supplemental oxygen and you're portable device and you're out walking around and you're active and your sats are in the nineties and you need to go up, you can turn that up. You're not going to over oxygenate yourself. It would take a really long time for anything like that to happen. So I think there is some kind of old school fear about that, but that's not really founded, uh, it, you know, today, if you need more oxygen, you can give yourself more oxygen if your device is capable of that. And a lot of times, you know, there, there are people that don't have those devices available to them, which is unfortunate especially the higher flow uh, users, um, you know, especially in the last 10 years, uh, you know, a lot of their options have kind of been taken from them. So, um, and we're really limited uh, the amount of portability that they can get out of their devices. So we can touch on that if we need to, but. Um. Well, I don't know, on perhaps a similar note, I believe it was Jory was asking, how do you know what's coming out of the concentrator is Accurate. You know, I, we had a brief discussion earlier about purity and that sort of thing. So, um, and that actually can be a concern. And we'll talk to that, talk, touch on that a little bit after you give us your answer. But um, how do we know that uh, we're getting what we're paying for, basically? Sure. The devices are set up 
to alarm once you kind of get below that 87% threshold. So most, most portable concentrators, most stationary concentrators, again, they're not putting out pure oxygen. It's anywhere from 87% to 95, 96% or so. Um, so that's kind of the, the threshold that they work in. And uh, the devices have way of sensing what the purity of, of the oxygen is. So if it is falling below that, um, you know, they should alarm. You know, is it guaranteed that that's going to happen? No, I can't say it's guaranteed, but you could, you know, feel fairly confident that if your device is not outputting the correct purity, it's going to tell you in some way. Um, you know, there, there may, for some people, there may be a difference in, in therapeutic benefit between if it's operating at 87% versus 95%. You might notice that, I oh, I'm not getting as much. I need to go up on a setting or something like that. But once it falls below kind of that therapeutic line of, of 87%, um, then, uh, you know, the, the devices will tell you. A lot of the portable concentrators, like your Inogens, they have the sieve beds on there. That's what separates the oxygen from, from the room air. Um, when those go bad, and I'm any concentrator, they're going to over time. Um, so that's why these, you know, especially the portable concentrators are, are, are really set up to, to know when they're, they're not performing the specification. So, I mean, I, I, I tend to think that, you know, you don't really have to worry about the device not telling you when it's not outputting purity. The stationary concentrator you have, especially if it's an older one, that may be a little different. That's where you'd need to say, have your home care provider or whoever is the supplier of that, you know, come out and have that tested. Uh, Cause those might not tell you, you know, where they're at, um, you know, especially older ones. Um, so, and I know some, some devices you might see, I know like the Respironics device, uh, the stationary, the, the Everflow, I think um, that has, you know, a model that is with and without uh, oxygen purity sensor on it. So you can ask those questions, say, all right, does my concentrator have an oxygen purity sensor on it? So you can be a little more comfortable. Uh, yeah, the that, that's the Everflow Q. In fact, Everflow. my guy was just out today and changed my filter and uh, and said uh, the purity was uh, 96. So I thought, well, that's <laughs> so I, I was very happy. When I did see someone, I think, oops, I think it was Patty mentioned that it's generally good practice for your your equipment provider to come out once a year at least and do maintenance and do those checks and that sort of thing so but it's uh, good practice I think, yes yeah is it happening? <laughs> the caveat is yeah the of course question. if that hasn't but, uh, happened for you by all means call call your provider and say yes. i haven't had my uh, equipment checked in a long time get your butt out here yeah you're paying for it i mean yep. Just, yep. I, I i had to call mine and remind them and they uh, they've gone through a personnel change. Bottom line, they came out, apologized, changed the filter, checked everything, brought me Kenya, and you know wished me happy holidays, and they were on their way. And so, along the lines of purity and everything, I do want to just highlight: um, we at the COPD Foundation have issued a position statement, and we actually have a petition slash open letter that everybody watching, uh, please, we, we'd ask you to, uh, we invite you to share, to sign on, all these sorts of things, because we're seeing in a variety of online retail settings, uh, some of the big names, some of the smaller ones, we are seeing a lot of uh, imported devices that are marketing themselves as oxygen concentrators. And they are advertising themselves as capable of doing things that no real oxygen con concentrator can do, like provide seven liters a minute of continuous flow and that sort of thing. Um, these devices may provide seven liters a minute of flow of gas, but uh, the oxygen purity is well below that therapeutic level that Ryan was talking about, sometimes even as low as in the barely above room air, which is 21%. We're seeing, you know, 28%, 30%. And so you don't want to get yourself into trouble. So we have created a petition on our website 
at copdfoundation.org where you can add your voice to the advocacy chain. And uh, we're going to be asking a lot of these retailers to be a little bit more diligent in removing these devices, these unsafe, non-FDA approved devices uh, from their websites. Uh, and we're, then we're going to be taking that to FDA as well as the Consumer Product Safety Commission because it is truly a patient safety issue. Um, we've got to do a better job of getting these things off the market and keep, keeping people safe. So. If you head over to copdfoundation.org um, and click on to our Advocacy Action Center, you can find that there. Um, so let's see what else yeah, we have if you, here. Just, just to kind of uh, piggyback on that, if, if you are looking for portable concentrators or family members might be thinking they're, you know, helping you out by, oh, I can buy this, you know, portable concentrators. The, th the things that you can kind of look for to, to kind of give you the red flag that you know this isn't what is purported to be is the first thing is cost these are often in the low hundreds um so it might say it's a portable concentrator capable of putting out five liters a minute you know and it's five hundred dollars you know most of the portable concentrators uh that you know we use are you know fifteen hundred to, to three thousand dollars or so so the, the first indicator should be cost um and if you see that it's it's below a thousand you might want to think, all right, what am I really looking at here? Um, if you're on a manufacturer website, and sometimes these are on the listings, I, I've seen these on Amazon and, and other places, um, you know, it, it, it should tell you what the purity at a given setting is. So you might see it at one where it's 92%, but as you go up and you get to five, then it's more like 45%. You know, is there a benefit to using five liters at 45%? Technically, there can be, but you know, as, as far as the FDA and, and medical professionals are concerned, that's not, you know, that's not how you right. want to be approaching it. You want your concentrator to be within that, you know, uh, uh, specified range of 87 to 95 percent. So, cost, and then if you can look at the details or whatever, and if it specifically says, you know, at a, at a higher liter flow setting that you know it's well below 87 percent, then you know that that's you know, yes, technically it is a concentrator. Technically, I guess it can be portable, um, but they are not approved devices. And, you know, I don't think any medical professional would, would recommend them. They shouldn't anyway. And some other good points coming through in the comments here. Uh, Noah says uh, devices are very similar to what you might find in an oxygen bar that uh, like in yes, Las Vegas yeah, or yeah, something like that. Yep, yep, not medical grade. Um, and Ricky also points out that when you get a concentrator you should have a prescription it's not the kind of thing that you just get on amazon or or what have you right. so exactly um, if you're not getting if you don't have a prescription for it and you're ordering it anyway again that should maybe be one of those red flags out there so yeah. again I'll that, point that's out, why i touched on if, if people that are wanting to support you are looking for equipment to buy for you um you know you need may need to share with them that you know you need a prescription for an oxygen concentrator. So if you're out there looking for one for me, you know, and you see a good deal, you know, make sure it needs a prescription, you know, in order to get. So, so we are coming up on the top of the hour. I do also want to point out again that uh, if you have questions that we didn't get to today, um, or if you think of something after the show here, I do invite you to come talk to come attend our OxyTalk next week, uh, Wednesday at 4 p.m. We've got contact information uh, on our Facebook page and uh, throughout our social media universe here, the Foundation uh, Cinematic Universe. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll get those questions answered. Ryan will be back next week. John will be back next week. For what it's worth, I'll be back next week. Um, and we'll have another good time over on Zoom. We did have a couple of questions kind of along the same lines. We've got Phyllis asking, can we talk about doctors saying not to get too much oxygen? And then we have Sherma, who shares a story that said in the 70s, uh, COPD patients were told that oxygen could overfill your lungs, causing more destruction. Uh, my father died with emphysema. He was cautioned about using oxygen. So first of all, Sherma, thank you for sharing that story. But I'd like to, uh, I have some views, of course, but I'd like to throw it over to John and Ryan to see what uh, what you think. Well, I, I, I'm not a clinician. I'm going to let uh, Ryan and Mike speak to it. But I, I, I that story, first of all, I, I'm sorry for your the loss of your father and 
the fact that he had troubles like that. But that whole story smacks of the uh, hypoxic drive theory, which that you become addicted to oxygen. You shouldn't use it because then you'll just you won't breathe without it. It's kind of like telling your car that, you know, we're going on a long road trip this summer, but I don't want to put any gas in it because then it'll want me to put gas in every time the tank's empty. Well, that's how the damn car runs. Well, that's how I run. I need oxygen. And if this little doohickey is telling me I'm not getting enough, and yes, it's got fresh batteries in it, then I need oxygen. So don't tell me I don't. And what I would, I know I'm on my soapbox. And what I would say to a doctor that told me that, I'd say, then how come it's acceptable for you to be at 96, 97, 98%? but not me. That's what I would say to him. And I would really like to be a fly on the wall to hear that answer. I'm going to turn it over to Ryan now. So yeah, John, John said it right. The idea is what they call hypoxic drive. And the, the idea that giving too much oxygen is going to knock out your drive to breathe because your body is saying, all right, I have more than enough oxygen to be functioning. I don't need to breathe as much. So that's kind of where the fear comes from, um, you know, and to the, to the idea that there's uh, oxygen is doing destruction to the lungs, like that needs to be a copious amount of oxygen for a really, 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 really long time um, for that to even kind of become an issue. As John was saying, if you need oxygen, you need oxygen. If your SAT monitor is saying 86, 88, turn your oxygen up. You're not going to go over. Um, and, you know, to kind of the discussion that we had earlier, if you don't need it, feel free to take it off. John's sitting here. He doesn't need it. He was at 94. If you're monitoring your oxygen and you are satting well and you take it off and you're still satting well, keep it off. You know, you don't have to have it on if you don't need the supplemental oxygen. So I think some people, you know, it, it in some situations, it's probably easier, if, especially if you're tethered to a stationary concentrator, you know, uh, you can't necessarily easily turn down uh, the dial if you're 50 feet away from your chair or whatever. Um, so if you still need some, you know, there, there's kind of issues there. You, it might not be as easy to turn it down. But, uh, you know, if, if, if you can be at rest and not need it, take it off. Um, but if you need it, you know, you don't need to worry about hypoxic. You know, this isn't a situation where you need to worry about that stuff and your doctor shouldn't be worrying about it either. You know, it would it would take a very extreme situation for anything like that to happen. And none of us are in that situation whatsoever. So um, if your doctor is saying, don't turn up your device, you know, you might consider educating them or maybe getting a different doctor that is already aware uh, of, of what supplemental oxygen is couple of things I would want to reinforce with that. Um, make, make sure you're measuring your oxygen. It is really easy to kind of get confused between shortness of breath and actually being hypoxemic with a low oxygen level. And you can't always sense which one is which. You can be hypoxemic and be relatively not short of breath. And similarly, you can be huffing and puffing and your oxygen level can be fine. So if you are going to, I believe John calls it, titrate and migrate yeah kind of i think that actually came from dr petty but titrate and migrate i mean if you turn it up if you need it turn it down if you don't need it titrate and migrate up but and it, but if you're going to do that make sure you're monitoring yourself so that you're not oh, yeah 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 at risk. Ba based on this not what i feel right um the other thing i'll point out is this whole thing with hypoxic drive the original study was done with roughly a dozen people and they saw what they thought might be this phenomenon and then they just assumed that's the way it was and they never went back and rechecked it and this is this study is what 50 60 years old now 70 uh it's a really old study it was a really small study it's one of those things that nowadays would probably just be kind of a footnote somewhere or you know the future research is needed additional research is needed um and somehow it kind of just became the truth and uh trained over and over again in rt circles and nursing circles doctor circles so everybody else is is on that so 
Um, I do. We've been we've been talking about pulse oximetry a lot, so I, I kind of do want to touch on that just a little bit, especially with COVID. You know, you you've probably seen pulse oximetry in the news a lot more than you did at any point before this. Um, you know, it is important to know that pulse oxes do have their own limitations. Things like the lighting in the room, your skin color, movement, those can all affect uh, the readings that you're getting on your oximeter. Um, the oximeter should not be used as a, you know, a, a diagnostic tool by any means. It's a tool, but it, it, you know, it's, it's not something that you can, for one, it's not a real-time reading of what, you know, what is going on with you. Those, those readings are delayed, and those delays might be different depending on the oximeter that you are using. And now we have all these smartphone devices and smartwatches or whatever that are using pulse oxes that are only on you know one side of the skin. Those are a bit more limited than your your standard pulse you know finger oximeter that is is using the infrared light that's going through your skin. Those are going to be a little more accurate than your uh, than your one sided uh, uh, oximeters. Um, and I will say you know pretty much any oximeter if you're in the 90s they're going to be good. Really, you'll start seeing the differences in quality uh, of those products uh, as you're desaturating and getting into the lowers. That's when the oximeters have a have a harder time keeping track of what's going on and where some of those other limitations like skin color and, and environment, you know, can, can impact those readings. So, you know, you can use your oximeter as kind of a trending tool and an idea of where you're at, but don't use that as an absolute value of what your uh, what your situation is at, at, at that moment and understand that the oximeter may not be accurately reading what is happening. So I just want to add just two real, real quick points. And I know you want to maybe get to another question and wrap it up, Mike, but with, with the pulse oximeter, they're accurate to within three points either way. So that, you know, if, if it says 88, me, I would turn it up because it could really be 85 because they're not that accurate it's not a blood draw it's not a blood gas the other thing don't get hung up on the numbers don't, don't be checking the reading every five minutes live your life you, you you know when you need to check it and be aware of what your numbers are always have your oximeter with you but for god's sakes stay active and just live your life don't get too hung up on the numbers you know we're, we're, we're not keeping a spreadsheet of each hour of every day. If, if some of us, might I, I would. So anyway, <laughs> I know Mike. there are people out there who have done that. So yeah, I know. Um, I know. <laughs> how, th those are fantastic words to live by. And I think that's actually a pretty good spot to, uh, to put an exclamation point on all this. Again, if you have questions that we didn't get to, um, or if you think of something else, or if you want to, if you, if you're talking about this with a friend, a family, uh, whoever, uh, please join us again next week, next Wednesday, one week from today. Otherwise, same bad time, same bad channel, actually a different channel. Cause we're going to be on zoom, but, uh, sign up for our oxy talk. You'll get reminders for that. Um, we're going to cover all kinds of other topics. We've, we've covered a lot of great stuff on these monthly talks for the last, uh, four or five months now. Uh, and they're always a good time. Ryan's going to be joining us again. Uh, so we really appreciate that. Um, Ryan and John, um, Really, thank you very much for your time, your expertise today. Uh, apologies again for the little tech issue at the beginning there, but I think we found our footing pretty well. Phyllis uh, coming in with a great additional words to live by. Manage your COPD. Don't let it manage you. So fantastic yep. talk today. Um, really appreciate everybody else uh, coming around and, and spending some of your Wednesday with us. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week uh, on Zoom. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you again in February back here on Facebook Live uh, for another Oxygen 360 Live. So thank you very much, everybody, and have yourselves a good evening. Thank you thank all. You.